Great. So welcome everybody uh, to the SIAG and FME seminar, financial seminar series. Uh, today we have uh, a special arrangement. We have a panel and uh, this panel is essentially targeting uh, towards addressing uh, what are the implications of COVID-19 on financial markets. So we have seen a lot of papers and a lot of studies about the dynamic of epidemics. This is more about what is happening real to the markets. And uh, we have the honor of having uh, very good speakers that are working on this uh, issues uh, firsthand. So at the Fed uh, and um, also at the Bank for International Settlement and uh, uh, David that is also somebody that has been working with mortgage for a long time. And um, I would like to like, um, start with um, panelists. Uh, in the order, we will have Michael Fleming, uh, we will start. And Michael is uh, Vice President uh, and Financial Economist uh, in the Capital Markets Function at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And he has been doing a lot of work in market microstructure, financial intermediation, and liquidity provisioning, and is going to share some insights about the work that they've been doing at the Fed in terms of um, addressing the liquidity problem of traded markets. Michael, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Agostino. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to discuss uh, how the Treasury market behaved in early 2020 in response to, to the pandemic. Um, before I get going, I'll start with a standard disclaimer. Uh, Views expressed are my own and not necessarily those of, of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. Um, so just for a quick overview, uh, in March 2020, the Treasury market experienced unusually high volatility, illiquidity, and dysfunction, and a sharp rise in yields, spurring an unprecedented, unprecedented policy response by the Fed. Now, there are parts of this um, that are not surprising. So um, the fact that the pandemic led to a lot of uncertainty about economic outcomes, um, the fact that that led to increased volatility and that that led to deterioration of, of liquidity, that's all not surprising. Similarly, the, the decline in yields in early 2020 overall is not surprising as you tend to see a flight to quality and, and decline in yields at a time of market turmoil. Um, now, what is surprising? Um, well, the pandemic itself, of course, but also the extent of the market dysfunction, um, and also this, this sharp rise in yields we saw in the March 10th to 18th period. Um, also surprising, I think, is the unprecedented uh, response by the Federal Reserve. So now in getting to the details, I think of the market developments, it's taking place in five stages. So in the first stage, yields declined modestly in January and most of February. So the 10 yield, for example, declined from uh, like 1.92% to 1.34% between, between um, uh, the end of December and February 26th. So, um, so in, in the chart below, the green line is the uh, a plot of the 10-year yield. So the first stage, I'm talking about this period here where yields are just kind of drifting down a bit. Um, the S&P 500 equity index rose over this period and financial market volatility was modest. So again, on the chart below, the this blue line is realized volatility of the 10-year note, and that was you know, pretty modest through January and most of February. Um, as of February 23rd, there were still only 15 confirmed COVID-19 cases in the US. Um, so it was really in late February that concerns about the pandemic increased notably. So in the second stage, we saw increased concerns about that pandemic drive yields sharply lower. So the 10-year plunged to about 80 basis points between February 26th and March 9th. Volatility increased sharply, and the S&P 500 fell almost 8% on March 9th alone. So if I can just go back here for one second, and um, I'm going to change the color here. So now I'm talking about this period where the 10-year yield is plunging and volatility is, is starting to shoot up. Um, we also saw that liquidity started to de deteriorate, especially March 6th and March 9th. So one measure of liquidity is the bid-ask spread. So in the chart below, I plot average bid-ask spreads by day for the most recently issued 5, 10, and 30-year securities. And um, you, know, you can see that these spreads were you know, really quite stable uh, in the early part of the year, and then they started to shoot up um, you know, in early March here. So the 30-year bid ask spread, for example, it's, it's, that's the purple line, it's typically just under 132nd of a point. 
and then you know it shot up to average over um, over five thirty seconds of a point at the height of the turmoil. So you know what did the Fed do to it's to start? Well, it cut the Fed funds rate by fifty basis points on March third, um, and um, you know due to the risks uh, to economic activity. And it also increased the size of its sizes of its repo operations starting March 9th to, to address disruptions in funding markets. So the third stage is probably the most interesting um, aspect of what happened. In this stage, yields reversed with the 10-year yield quickly rising about 65 basis points by March 18th. Treasury volatility continued to rise, peaking March 13th, and the S&P 500 declined on net amid high volatility. Liquidity Oh, um, I'll just go back one last time to that earlier slide. So now I'm talking about this period, yields rebound um, and volatility kind of continues to go up. And liquidity, um, yeah, continued to deteriorate, reaching its worst point March 13th. Um, the bid ask spreads reached the highest level since the 2007-09 financial crisis. Um, another measure of liquidity is price impact. Um, Price impact basically measures how much the price increases or decreases for a given amount of buying or selling. And um, you can kind of see that the pattern of price impact over time is actually quite similar to the, to the pattern of bid-ask spreads. Um, we also saw pricing dislocations across cash and futures markets, um, indicating a breakdown of arbitrage. Um, so, you know, what explains this, this yield increase over this period? Well, we think there was unwinding of relative value trades by leveraged investors. So uh, investors that bought treasuries and cash in the cash market and hedged those positions in the futures market, that they started unwinding their positions as futures prices rose. And this led to higher volatility and higher margins, which then spurred further, further selling. So uh, this kind of created a, a what's called you know, a margin spiral. Um, we also saw record selling of notes and bonds by foreign investors. Now, this is true both um, on a net basis and in gross terms. So uh, the chart below, it's um, from Daryl Duffy's Brookings paper, and it shows that foreigners' gross selling of treasury notes and bonds in March um, was a record uh, $2.7 trillion. It was, uh, dealers had limited capacity to absorb these sales. Uh, their inventories were already quite high, kind of going into the, the pandemic, and um, they faced balance sheet constraints and internal risk limits. Um, also, principal trading firms, these are firms that are some of the most active firms in the interdealer market. Uh, they reduce their activity as a share of, of overall activity in the market. So again, the Fed, what the Fed do? Well, it lowered the target rate of further 100 basis points on March 15th, um, as shown in the chart below. Um, it announced the same day it would increase holdings of treasury securities and agency MBS by hundreds of billions of dollars to support the functioning of these markets, which are really critical to, um, you know, to markets overall. Um, and also on March 17th, the Fed announced it would restart the primary dealer credit facility uh, to smooth market functioning by providing funding to primary dealers, which are, which are market makers for treasury securities and other securities. So we then get to the fourth stage, liquidity starts to improve. Um, it particularly improved after March 15th, uh, the, the, when there was that Fed announcement, and especially after March 23rd. Uh, yields declined sharply after March 18th. Um, and of, of particular note is that on March 23rd, the FOMC announced it would continue to purchase Treasury Securities and Agency MBS in the amounts needed to support market functioning and effective uh, policy transmission. So the chart there shows um, the Fed purchases of treasuries by day over the first four months of 2020. Um, and you can see there's um, a two week period there in, in late March and early April, you know, when the Fed was buying, um, the Fed's purchases were totaling, you know, 70 to 75 billion per day. Uh, although those, you know, started to come down after that. So, you know, kind of the last stage is that um, the markets, you know, calmed somewhat as the Fed purchases continued. So yields were stable pretty much after March 27th. Uh, liquidity measures continued to improve. Uh, equity market volatility declined and the S&P 500 rose. Um, even as liquidity was improving, the Fed did announce some additional measures to, to improve market functioning. So 
um, on March 31st, uh, it announced the launch of the FEMA repo facility. This allows foreign central banks to raise US dollars against the holdings of treasury securities at the Fed, thereby reducing foreign central banks' incentives to sell treasuries in the open market. Um, also on, a, on um, April 1st, the Fed relaxed the uh, supplementary leverage ratio. Um, it basically implemented a change that excluded treasuries from the SLR denominator for bank holding companies, which increased the incentive or, or decreased the disincentive uh, for, for banks to hold treasury securities on their balance sheet. Um, oh, the, the last chart here, this is just one more measure of market liquidity. Um, this chart shows order book depth um, by day for the five, 10 and 30 year. Um, so order book depth is just measured as um, the quantity of securities available to be bought or, or, or sold at the, fifth, at the best five prices uh, in the interdealer market. And so um, what you see is um, for the 10 year, for example, the av that's the, um, the green line, you know, the average daily depth was, the average depth was close to 300 million um, in the January and February period. And then it dropped as low as um, 19 million on March 13th. So this is just, you know, one more measure of, of liquidity showing really the um, highly unusual um, disruption uh, to, to liquidity at the time. So, um, you know, I think overall, there's a lot we know about market developments earlier this year, uh, but there are still some unanswered questions I'm gonna leave you with. Um, first of all, you know, just what was the role of hedge funds in the March turmoil? So, I mean, there was some early work that was um, suggesting that um, hedge funds might've played a big role, uh, just that, you know, through these uh, unwinding of these basis trades, but, you know, recent work has kind of cast doubt on the importance of, of hedge fund sales. Um, we do know that you know there was massive selling. Uh, the, the data is clear on that. But you know who who exactly was selling and why? Um, I think that's you know worthy of further investigation. Um, we know PTFs withdrew from the market. Again, there's good data on that. But you know which way does causality go? Did the PTFs withdrawing from the market exacerbate the illiquidity, or was it just the illiquidity that caused the PTFs to step back? Um, Fourth, you know, to what extent does the growth of debt outstanding make March 2020 episodes more likely? This is the concern expressed by Daryl Duffy in his recent Brookings paper. Um, and then lastly, uh, are there policy steps or, or additional policy steps that should be taken to reduce the chances of a March 2020 episode occurring? Um, so that uh, concludes my prepared remarks. Thank you so much, Michael, for this very interesting uh, overview. Uh, let's go ahead with the next uh, panelist, uh, Wang Yang. Wang, uh, Wang Yang, maybe Michael, you can, uh, yeah, sh stop sharing and Wang Yang, you can start sharing your slides. Thank you. Yeah, when you share, I will introduce Wang Yang, who is uh, like an economist at the Bank for International Settlement uh, in Basel. So that's the bank that uh, makes the guidelines uh, for banks and asset managers. And uh, she has a PhD in economics from the Free University of Amsterdam, and she has been very active in um, like questions related to central clearing counterparties, margins, and uh, systemic risk. Please, uh, Wing Yan, go ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Agostino, for having me here and for the nice introduction. Um, just to check, you can uh, see my screen and listen to me clearly, right? Yeah, we can listen. Fantastic, yeah. yes. Um, yeah, so uh, as Michael said, the usual disclaimer for me also applies to so the views here are all mine and not necessarily of the BIS. Um, so today, uh, yeah, so as uh, Agostino said, uh, yeah, I'm, I would discuss some impact of the COVID-19 on uh, CCPs or clearing houses, central counterparties. Um, yeah, so I would use them uh, interchangeably. Um, basically, yes. Um, basically, as Michael already mentioned, that uh, the, the market turbulence uh, induced by COVID-19 in March uh, has prompted some large margin calls because of the exceptionally volatile uh, market conditions. Uh, despite the market uh, turbulence, uh, CCPs, they remained resilient. Uh, there, were few, there were few uh, uh, default cases of uh, clearing members. So in general, uh, uh, market functions rather smoothly uh, at the back end, but still these large margin calls were felt strongly 
uh, among the market participants. So here uh, in, a, in a BIS bulletin, we show that uh, in the third panel here, that initial margin requirements for equity futures in the US has doubled since March. And the Asian CCPs in the fourth panel also hiked their initial margin requirements substantially during March. And this is uh, cross-checked by other uh, publications. So the ECB Financial Stability Report also reported that European CCP's margins, uh, including initial margin and variation margin, increased from 10 billion euro to over 60 billion euro uh, in March. And the Bank of England Interim Financial Stability Report also shows that the UK CCP's variation margin uh, was five times uh, at the peak, as high as the pre-COVID level. So, uh, so I hope this would convince you that uh, March, is, March was a very exceptional period. Um, large margin calls were, uh, were issued and, um, and these include both initial margin calls and variation margin calls. So you may ask, what are the differences between these two? So here we show uh, the balance sheet, the stylized balance sheet of uh, CCP and their clearing member, for instance, banks. And here what you can see is that, uh, suppose these two banks, they are clearing members of the CCP, then to be qualified as a clearing member, uh, the banks would need to uh, pledge liquid asset as the default fund with the CCP. So these are the dark blue cells. Uh, so you can see that default fund would sit on the asset side for the banks or clearing members, uh, and it would sit at the liability side uh, for the CCP. So it's sort of a, a contingent liability for the CCP. And then when the bank A and bank B want to transact a, a, a contract, uh, both of them would need to pledge initial margin. That is because uh, CCP after clear this transaction would officially be the counterparty for both uh, bank A and bank B. So in case of each of these banks default, then the CCP would have to honor uh, their commitment to, the, to their counterparty. So the CCP would bear this counterparty credit risk. And to manage that counterparty credit risk, CCPs would ask for initial margin. So these are the uh, light blue cells. So again, they are the uh, assets for banks and liability for CCPs. So these are the initial margin. While variation margin uh, happened after the, the price move of the contract. So uh, for instance, in this case, we have bank A has out of money positions. Then the bank A would have to settle their mark to market exposure by paying this variation margin to the CCP. And the CCP after collecting this variation margin from bank A would distribute that to bank B. So as you can see, this is the variation margin settled uh, mark to market exposures and they flow uh, through CCP. So in this case, um, uh, in this simple uh, stylized effect, one can see that the initial margin they has um, aggregate uh, liquid, liquidity impact on their members balance sheet, while variation margin has distributional liquid as uh, liquidity impact. So these are sort of a, a very, sim uh, very simple, very stylized uh, example. In real operations, there, um, uh, uh, there are some uh, bells and whistles. So for, for one thing, initial margin, for instance, uh, is more persistent uh, compared to variation margin. And that is because of the look back period of initial margin, which I would explain later. And apart from that, uh, some of the CCPs, they would reinvest the collected initial margin in repo market, and that would mitigate uh, their uh, aggregate liquidity impact. Uh, apart from that, uh, in some of the cases, variation margin can also have temporary aggregate impact if there's some uh, time delay between the collection of the VM and the distribution of the VM. And this is also related to how CCPs manage their uh, manage their liquid assets. So if they put that in a repo market, then uh, normally you would expect some operational uh, lag between the collection of VM and the distribution of VM. So, uh, but in general speaking, the, 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 uh, the practic uh, practicality here uh, would have some impact, but not prominent impact on the, on the liquidity implications of margins. So, Mainly, uh, we want to talk about practicality of margins, uh, both initial margin and variation margin uh, of this March event. So uh, one thing is that to some extent, margins, they are, um, they are 
by default uh, procyclical because they have to be risk-based. Uh, you want your margin to reflect uh, the, the, the market conditions uh, of the, and also the uh, counterparty credit risk of the portfolio. So uh, in this case, uh, one would say large price movements would mechanically trigger large variation margin calls. Um, and and the, the practicality of IM would also depend on their risk models, uh, the risk parameters of the CCPs. So in general, uh, simply put, CCPs, they would set initial margin to cover the potential default losses with a high probability, normally with 90, uh, 99 percentile. And to estimate these potential default losses, CCPs normally use these value at risk models. So basically they look at the uh, historical uh, period uh, and see what would be the uh, value at risk of that uh, loss distribution. So this means that the length of this historical period, the so-called look back period would be critical. So for instance, with a long look back period, uh, one would expect the IM models to be uh, to cover the historical uh, high volatility. So the volatility spikes, uh, for instance, the spikes in March would be less likely to surprise the model. While models with a short uh, look back period are likely to be more precyclical because uh, it, would, it would move um, uh, as, the short, as the volatility spikes come. And in the, in the case with, short, uh, with a short look back period, then CCPs may be uh, forced to catch up by increasing IM when, uh, when the, the shock is realized. So that is sort of exactly at the wrong time because uh, in stress periods, clearing members will also, in, will also be in a greater need of liquidity. So what we look at is the, the pre-COVID uh, 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 pre COVID level of this um, uh, margin parameters. So one thing we see is that the achieved coverage ratio, so how the initial margin covered uh, the past observations is fairly high uh, pre-COVID. We see that this starting from 99.5. So basically for all the uh, different uh, CCPs in our, in our sample, they are above 99.5 percentile. So it's very, very um, uh, robust. It's very, very uh, uh, conservative. Um, and uh, the margin breaches, they are also small, but remember these are the pre-COVID um, scenario. Uh, one, but one thing that is rather uh, uh, unnerved, uh, unnerving is the look back period. So here we can see that the commodity, uh, which are the purple bars here, and equities, uh, which are the, uh, the, the uh, coffee bar here, they are, they are pretty small. Uh, the look back period, they are pretty uh, small compared to other type of products. So the, the, the ongoing debate uh, is that, um, is it the case that uh, the commodity and equity CCPs or I mean some other CCPs, they were lagging behind uh, before the COVID and needed to catch up with huge margin calls uh, exactly when, this, when their members were under uh, liquidity stress. Um, so this is a very crucial uh, policy uh, uh, question because um, as CCPs, they are systemically important. It is very important to, uh, to, to make sure that the micro prudential uh, regulations on CCPs were set uh, correctly. And related to that, uh, some of the jurisdictions, they have this anti prosecutality margin measures. Um, so to some extent, uh, anti prosecutality doesn't mean that the margin measures, they are not prosecutical. Uh, because as I said, you want the margin measures to be risk-based. You want it to reflect um, the, the counterparty credit risk uh, was higher uh, during uh, the stress period. So the anti prosecutality margin is more like um, uh, avoiding excessive prosecutality. So you don't want to have these uh, margin hikes um, so, so large that uh, not because of the, the market condition has changed, but because the CCPs were too relaxed uh, in the stress period. So, so for this, the, for this anti prosecutality margin measures, it, it's important to evaluate their impact on the, on the uh, market participants. And also it is important uh, for policymakers to think about whether a, a, a pillar two type of counter-cyclical buffer uh, would, be, would be useful for CCP macroprudential regulations. And then the third question is related to uh, uh, what I have mentioned 
uh, about this the reliance on repo market to manage liquid uh, liquid uh, assets. So basically, CCPs have different ways to manage their liquid assets. Um, some of them rely on the repo market, uh, while the others relied on the central bank reserve account. So normally speaking, uh, foreign CCPs would not have uh, reserve accounts with uh, central banks. Uh, but then uh, with this the repo market, you will have operational lag, you would have, uh, you would have some benefit of recycling uh, liquidity, but you will also have some uh, operational glitch, a potential operational glitch. So it's important to understand the cross-border and cross-currency implications of these different methods and to think about whether uh, it's necessary for central banks to extend some temporary access to uh, foreign CCPs in stress times so that uh, there's an option for these CCPs to uh, put their liquid assets uh, in different in, in foreign currencies with the with the with the um, uh, foreign central bank uh, reserve account so i will stop here and i look forward to uh, uh, a lively discussion uh, on the on the covid in general Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Wingyan, for a very interesting uh, presentation about CCP and systemic risk. Let us uh, move on uh, to the next and last panelist, uh, David Rios. Uh, David, you can go ahead and share the slides. Uh, hi, hello, everybody. So we're going to try to give you an overview of the, what's been going on in the mortgage market. Oh, let me introduce you first. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. So basically, David is, uh, has 16 years of experience in uh, mortgage, in the mortgage market. He's been trading a variety of products uh, during his career as a trader. And then he joined uh, Columbia in the statistics department as a junk professor. And uh, today he's going to discuss about the, the implications of COVID-19 on mortgages and housing markets. Yeah. Great, ready? Go ahead. Yeah. Great. Uh, screens up okay? Yeah, it's good. Perfect, let's start. Great. So in March, as we've seen before, the, the markets fell apart. The mortgage market was no exception, right? Uh, as discussed before, March saw both uh, funding issues and a wave of unemployment. I guess the unemployment wasn't discussed before. Uh, as a consequence, both the Fed reacted quickly and Congress reacted quickly. So the Fed, part of the reaction we discussed before, Congress, that part is new, okay? For the mortgage market, this meant two things. This meant a two-pronged approach. The jab basically was a forbearance of mortgage foreclosures. That's the CARES Act. We'll get into that. And then the hook was a large scale MBS purchase program by the Fed. Okay. That. Great. So let's look what happened and just in terms of purchases. We were, so we, we've already talked a little bit about the Fed uh, Treasury purchase program. Let's look at the mortgage pur purchase program. So, so far since, since the Fed has started buying, the gross purchases have been over a trillion. Of course, there's been pay downs on the old mortgage position they have. So the net purchases have been about 600 billion. What's also interesting to look at as a comparison number, as there's been more house purchases and as people refi and take cash out, the mortgage market grows in size. So while the net purchases have been 600 billion, the change in the size of the agency pass-through market has been 400 billion. So the headline number of, you know, a trillion purchase is a big number, but the marginal effect is less than that. And what's pretty interesting, if you compare the purchases now versus what happened in 2008, you can just see in the lower right hand graph, that's the Fed purchase by mortgage coupon. So the Fed makes two decisions, two buy mortgages, oh, sorry, two buy mortgages and which coupon to buy. They are making much more targeted, the Fed is, seems to be making much more targeted positions about which coupon to buy. You see that a changing behavior every month, okay? Now, so purchases have spiked and so has production. Here's just a long-term graph of the last 20 years. The blue line is 10-year treasury. Mortgages uh, tend to increase in production when treasuries drop. And the orange line is mortgage production, number of loans produced by the three agencies per month. So you see recently we had this spike in production, but the spike we're having now, which is interesting, is much less than in 2009 and way less than 2003. That's interesting as its own issue, okay? We'll get to the one later. So this spike in production has translated into lower 
lower mortgage rates. So in other words, you know, this, the Fed does these programs to inject more money into the economy. Some of the money goes directly into banks. When the purchase of treasury, it goes directly into Congress to, to spend. And some of it, as the purchase of mortgages, ends up in the pocket of homeowners. And here you can see what mortgages are being produced entire year. Basically, the tenure has not really moved in rates since March. And you can see that the mortgage rate for uh, this is one of the sub program with is one of the sub programs has been dropping each and every month, even without the tenure moving too much. Okay, so these are the number of mortgages originated each month stratified by coupon. Okay, now. And on the flip side, you can also see that the rates you can also see the mortgage rates that the borrowers are leaving. These are CPRs, this is annual prepayment rates for different coupons for the same mortgage program we see. And you can see each month, the rate at which people are leaving the higher coupons picks up. And you can even see some of the lower coupons, you know, two and three quarters, almost nobody left that in June. In September, they're, rating at, they're leaving at the rate of 50% per year. And this is liquidity slowly getting to the homeowner through the, being injected by the Fed. So that's kind of cool to see. Okay. That's one aspect. That's the Fed purchase of mortgages, uh, pushing prepayments. Let's look at another thing. Let's look at another thing that's happened since then. Let's look at the credit side a little bit. So in March, not only did rates move, but unemployment uh, spiked. A lot of people were told to furlough. They couldn't not to go to work, they had no income coming in, okay? Under normal conditions, this is a huge problem for consumer credit. This is a huge problem for credit cards, for mortgages, for everything, okay? Uh, great, so normally this type of thing would get in the way. Let's see what Congress did. So in March, Congress passed the CARES Act to address some of the issues. One of the things buried in the CARES Act is a moratorium against foreclosures on agency-backed mortgages. Normally, if you missed your mortgage payment for three months, the bank has the right to foreclose on your property. Okay. As people were asked to stay home for two months, three months, it's very easy for people that are normally good credit to lose their property. Okay. Congress and, and most likely the Treasury didn't want this going through, and we'll see why. Uh, so that was put into the act. Ah, sorry. Anyway, and you can see you see in the economy that delinquencies have been rising. We're just looking at Jenny right now because it's easier. It's the easiest way to grab the delinquency data. Here's the 30-day delinquency, which is the blue number, and the orange number, the 60-day delinquency. Okay, so 30-day, you miss one payment. 60-day, you miss two payment. This is millions of dollars, right? These numbers are unprecedented. You see the spike coming in with COVID with the initial shutdown. You see the 60 day spike one month later, and you still see delinquencies at a relatively high pace. Okay, great. What's amazing is even though we've seen these delinquencies, because the delinquencies are not translating into foreclosures, we have not seen HPI, we've not seen housing prices go down. In fact, we've seen housing prices go up. So normally what you'd expect is a lot of people lose their jobs. They need to sell their houses or by them or the bank. A lot of houses hit the market, prices drop. Instead, we've seen prices go up. And a lot of this is because of the moratorium and foreclosures has, has, has stopped the supply gut from hitting the market, okay? Now, why is this interesting for us? One reason it's interesting, uh, okay. one reason it's interesting for us when you refinance your loan, one of the major components is loan to value. People will look at the value of your home, the size of the mortgage. If your house, if on paper your house drops a lot in value, you no longer have access to capital markets. If on paper your house stays stable or goes up in price, you still have access to the capital markets. Okay? So the Fed is trying to use the capital markets to get money into many people's hands. Some of them are the homeowners. Congress is CARES Act, stopping the housing prices from dropping, has allowed many more homeowners to access the capital markets 
than would be if that was not passed and we have an artificial drop in housing prices because of a large number of foreclosures over the summer. So you see this two-pronged effort, part done by Congress, part done by the Fed, part takes care of the credit, part takes care of the rates, and you start to see liquidity slowly enter the mortgage markets. Okay? And then there's a lot of fun things to do on that. Uh, there's a lot of fun things to do on that. Mortgage rates right now are still pretty high considering where the tenure is. Uh, two and a half percent seems like a great mortgage rate, but it's still basically two points over the tenure, still a traditionally very high mortgage rate. You still see production much less in 2003, much less in 2008. So there is some friction in the system that I'm sure if the Fed is actually trying to use mortgages to get money in homeowners' hands and, and to, uh, that th the sources of this friction would be of interest. You still see that. And then you still see a lot of other funding issues for non-banks. So for example, this is a sort of a fun graph. These are banks, these are mortgage loans serviced by banks and non-banks. Do the interests of the mortgage market after 90 days, after a three months default, a servicer can either buy out the loan or keep paying its coupon. So it has to fund the loan either way. Banks that have access to cheap funding are able to buy out the loans, they buy out the delinquency pipeline, and the 90 plus delinquencies stay pretty low. Mortgage servicers, on the other hand, don't have access to this capital and they start choking on these delinquent loans. They have to make many more payments than they thought they would ever have to make. And it depletes their capital base. So there's a lot of fun things about this. You get to watch in real time as liquidity enters the system and gets into people's hands and you get to watch the frictions with it and it's fun to watch it unfold. Thank you, David. I presume you're done. Okay, I think we're good. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, so we have heard from uh, like the three different panelists. So now I would like to open the discussion uh, to the audience and uh, please uh, feel free to ask any questions. I mean, just a signal that you want to ask a question in the chat and you will be able to, to speak live. Uh, there is a question uh, by Let's see, uh, Gabriel Boragero, I think you have the, um, the permission to speak, so please go ahead. Gabriel. Um, Agustino, I can see the question. If you want, I can read okay. it and, and answer it. Yeah, yeah, okay, maybe go ahead, you can. Read and ask the answer the question. Sure. Um, first, yeah. So the question, um, well, there's two parts to it. I'll, I'll I'll read the first part and answer that. How's that? <laughs> um, with yields so low and and low for so long, how confident are the Fed that rate cuts are having the desired effect on the economy? Uh, it feels like the wider market is interpreting rate cuts as a sign of weakness. Um, so to answer that, I mean, I would say first of all, I'd go back to my disclaimer and say, of course, I'm not speaking for the Fed. I'm not, I'm speaking for myself. Um, and then, uh, but to answer the question, I'd say, well, you know, this has been an issue for some time. I mean, the zero lower bound has been an issue for some time. Um, the Fed, of course, cut rates to the zero lower bound. Um, it didn't cut rates more because of the zero lower bound. So, I mean, that in itself, I mean, is kind of evidence that, you know, the traditional policy tool, um, you know, has kind of limited firepower. Um, you know, one, one way the Fed has responded to this is by providing forward guidance. So, um, you know, just looking at like the most recent FOMC policy statement, for example, um, it says, you know, the committee expects it will be appropriate to maintain this target range until labor market conditions have reached levels consistent with the committee's assessment of maximum employment and, infl and inflation has risen to 2% and is on track to moderately, ex moderately exceed 2% for some time. So. Um, you know, this is kind of, you know, one way the Fed has dealt with um, having that zero lower bound on the short-term policy rate is by providing forward guidance, which, you know, one would think would put downward pressure on longer term rates as well. Um, and then I think the last way, you know, one could answer this question is by saying that um, I think it's, you know, widely acknowledged that the Fed has limited tools. I mean, the Fed, it's, it's responsible for monetary policy. Um, there are other parts of the government that are responsible for fiscal policy. So, 
yeah, certainly the Fed has limited tools to address uh, something like a pandemic. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, so I have a question related to the presentation by Ben Yuan on uh, Central Kring. Um, so I, if I understand correctly, uh, your point is that if you already have, uh, if you are using a large window to decide uh, or to determine what's the the worst case losses, which determine the margins, then uh, they were not. The, then then the, um, this large the, the pandemic didn't didn't come as a real, real it was not perceived as a large shock because somehow the margins that uh, were set aside were already large enough but for those uh center carrying other parties which were setting the margins using a smaller window then the, the size of the margin was lower and therefore the pandemic came as a shock is it is it the right way of interpreting it Yes, and uh, although I, I also want to acknowledge that the, the March episode uh, seemed to be even more volatile in some, in some sense uh, compared to the GFC. So um, people can also argue even with a long enough uh, look back period, uh, still the, the March uh, episode would come as a surprise because it's basically unprecedented. Um, so to that, I, I still want to emphasize that uh, because the, the value at risk measure uh, normally used by CCPs uh, to, to calculate this IM uh, is, the, is, is a quantile, right? So, so even though, um, even though the, the, the March episode is, it might be more volatile for some uh, asset classes compared to the GFC, compared to the historical uh, largest, uh, uh, highest volatility. Still, if you have, a, uh, if you have uh, the, the highest volatility in your sample, then the, the level of the margin before the, before the, the uh, COVID crisis will still be higher compared to the scenarios uh, where you have a short look, at, look back period. So still the difference between um, the, the March margin and the pre-COVID uh, margin level would be different uh, for CCPs with a short uh, look back period and CCPs with a long look back period. So the point is that um, it's, it's better to have a long, well, in terms of mitigating uh, procyclicality, it is better to have a longer look back period given the, the, the same um, uh, pro risk parameters, uh, yeah. given other, other risk parameters remain the same. And does this look back video explain why we haven't seen many defaults, many margin breaches? I think one of your first slides was showing that <laughs> uh -huh. the margin breach was not large. So not many clearing members, sir. Yes, so uh, indeed, so what I show is the uh, December uh, 2019 margin breaches. So that is pre-COVID. So pre-COVID, uh, the market basically is in tranquil time and the uh, margin breaches are small. But actually the, the most recent data, the Q1 and Q2 data, uh, I mean, the Q1 data mainly shows that uh, the margin breaches pick up uh, in Q1. And, um, but luckily, I think, uh, as Michael said, uh, Fed and other central banks as well, uh, has done a lot <laughs> in supporting market liquidity. So to some extent, we are not really seeing um, a test of the CCPs uh, and banks uh, 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 risk management uh, capability because, yeah, because central banks, they are acting as the the the, la, uh, the last resort of uh, buyers, right? So, so to some extent, the, the central bank intervention support uh, asset prices and resolve uh, 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 liquidity crunch uh, very smoothly, uh, very swiftly, and uh, and that has helped a lot. And I think that is the that is part uh, of the reasons that we don't see a lot of defaults and we don't see a lot of uh, disruptions uh, in post trade uh, uh, financial. Uh, systems. I see. Thank you. Uh, there is a question by Anders Riveros. Anders, uh, do you want to go ahead and ask? Sure. sure. Uh, so, you, the three of you, were, were discussing effects after after the, the month of March, right, where we saw the, the the turmoil in the market, which was clear in all of your presentations. However, the, the pandemic was hitting large markets way before that. We had. It started in November, then 
hit Europe in January. So wh wh why were these effects in, in your respective areas were seen uh, at the beginning of March and not before? I think the market put very little probability on the, on the COVID having such a big impact on the U.S. before then. The market, market can't see the future. It can be wrong all the time. What the market's really good at is reacting very quickly when it realizes it's wrong. And that's what happened in a very short period of time in March. Uh, Michael and Vinyan, do you want to add anything? Um, no, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I would, I would have just said, yeah, that the, um, yeah, the market just seemingly didn't think that it was going to be that much of an issue for the U.S. In, until then. Thank you. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with the other panelists. And um, uh, I also particularly uh, uh, with David on this, that uh, markets are, markets forecast about, um, about uh, 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 market forecast about the future might be very, uh, uh, might be very noisy. Uh, but cross-sectionally speaking, I think it's, uh, it's, it's more, it's more uh, precise. question on the um, please uh, as usual feel free to ask uh, to signal if you want to ask questions but meanwhile I have a question for Michael uh, regarding the liquidity measures that you're using uh, I mean um, I, I presume that you are also speaking about this time dimensional liquidity because you meant that the inventories of the market makers were becoming large right I mean they were not mm -hmm. able to absorb all this pressure or this selling pressure that's right. And uh, I mean, the, do you think this dimension like is like responsible for increasing the bid as, is the primary dimension that is increasing the bid as spread or there are other considerations that go into that? I mean, what is causing the, the spikes? Yeah, sure. I, um, I mean, first and foremost, I would say the pandemic just greatly increased uh, uncertainty about the economy. And, you know, given that you'd expect you know, the increased uncertainty to lead to high volatility and the high volatility increases the risk of, you know, making markets and taking positions and that should lead to wider bid ask spread. So that was all um, as expected. Uh, but yes, I think, um, you know, dealer balance sheets constraints, the fact that dealers already held fairly large positive treasury positions going into the pandemic, that that exacerbated the illiquidity. So that that was an additional factor that caused spreads uh, to widen. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, the other factors discussed as well, um, you know, just the massive selling pressure um, and, you know, perhaps the, the fact that the principal trading firms um, reduce their activity, at least as a share of the overall market. Thank you. Um, so Agostino, related to that, can I ask a follow-up question to Michael? Yes, sure. Yeah. Um, so Michael, uh, so one thing that is uh, that was quite surprising to me is that uh, after the after the announcement of the uh, uh, the temporary exemption of uh, treasury in the supplemental supplementary uh, leverage ratio regulation, um, it seems that the market does not did not uh, respond to that very strongly. So. So is that the case or you, you see that differently? And um, uh, mainly, do you find that the supplement, uh, supplementary leverage ratio is a, is a binding factor for, for the dealers? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Um, so the, you know, the relaxation of the SLR ratio, um, I mean, it took effect after, I think, you know, more significant or you know, more, more changes that are maybe more relevant to market functioning, and in particular, um, the initiation of the market functioning purchases, and then you know, the, the expansion of those, you know, the, the announcement that the Fed would kind of buy in the amounts needed to improve market functioning. So um, I think those were kind of the critical announcements. And um, you know, then, then the SLR announcement came after that, and I agree with you, I don't, um, in the time series, I don't see anything that suggests um, uh, you know, like a, a notable or, yeah, notable improvement in liquidity after that particular announcement. Um, and it could be that, um, yeah, that there are other, there are other regulations that bind. So, um, loosening one doesn't necessarily buy you all that much. 
Thank you, Michael. Um, we have a question from Arash. Arash, uh, feel free to ask. Okay, I think Arash said it's noisy, so I will uh, read the question. He said that the decision to meddle with the market to mitigate the effect of COVID, uh, regarding that, is it made by career employees or by appointed ones? Oh, sure. Well, this is um, kind of like um, Fed, Fed, you know, a Fed Governance 101 question. Um, so there's the, the Federal Open Market Committee, which is making, um, uh, you know, a lot of these decisions, the, the Federal Open Market Committee that consists of um, five presidents of reserve banks and then, you know, seven governors in Washington. The, the governors in Washington are appointed by the, the president of the United States. Um, the five regional bank presidents, they're appointed by their individual bank board of directors and then approved by the, um, by the board of governors in Washington. So, um, so I'd say it's a mix, but um, I'd say probably, you know, for the FOMC, it's m mostly, um, you know, presidential appointees. And there is a question by Boris Davidoff. Um, his question is whether risk, model, risk modeling in the reality of the world economy, why are these in the Fed view on the US economy for the one year period? Um, so um, I'm a little unsure kind of like what exactly the question is. I don't know if he's asking whether it's for one year or not a longer period. Whether, I mean, that's say, fine. That's the possible interpretation of this question, whether these are only for a one year period or for a longer period. Um, what, the, what, what are only for a one year period? Uh, this, um, this measures of, you know, measures of modeling risk. But I don't know, I mean, maybe we can skip this question because it seems a bit ambiguous. So yeah, he's, he said that if any risk, if there is any risk modeling for the future by the Fed, if the Fed is changing perhaps the way that is modeling risk, I don't know. It seems a broad question. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, um, yeah. I, I guess I'm not probably not the best person to speak to you know um, the risk modeling that that. Uh, it's underdone by the Fed, but the Fed's a huge place. So we've got lots of people in, you know, many different areas. Yeah. And there's a question by Gabriel Boragero. Um, that's, that's what we, we talked about. Okay, so you asked the question. Well, this, this, I mean, there is yield in the market. To so the second part, there is yield in the market. The curve is steep. It's the absolute level of yields are lower than people are used to, yeah. but the yield curve is steep. We don't have a flat yield curve. There's plenty of yield in the mortgage market. Again, two and, a, two and three quarters is a low rate historically, but it's not low compared to where the 10-year is. I'm sure in the CMBS market, when the defaults start coming through, you can buy stuff at 10, 20, 50% yield. So there is, there is yield out there. It's just the absolute levels are lower than what people are used to. But that's, that's the world we live in. Yeah. So I mean, another questions uh, to all of you, maybe David specifically, I mean, the, how would you compare the mortgage market in 2007, 2009 and the mortgage market today? I mean, do you think the reason why the impact on house price is not being that large is because of the lesson learned from 2007 or it's more because uh, the shock is uh, lower that because the, somehow the US up and the, 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 especially the US economy was quite, uh, quite strong before the crisis hit, right? It was um, not as weak as during the 2007, 2009 period. I think, I think a, um, one of the big differences is there's much less uncertainty in the value of the underlying assets. I see. So in 2008, not only do we have agency mortgages, but we had a lot of cash out refis. So if somebody would buy their house for $500,000, three years later, they would get a loan for $800,000. So they would have a very tight LTV. Plus, instead of the simple structure type mortgages that US people generally got, they were all sources of mortgages with interest rate uh, options embedded in them. Okay. And there was a lot more fraud in the underlying mortgages. The same for the CMBS market and the same for the agency market. 
On top of that, you had CDO markets and CDO square markets that allowed people to sell the same suspect mortgages two or three times. So there was huge uncertainty of the value of the underlying assets. So for a six month period, nobody wanted to touch anything because you could buy a bond that you thought had one point price difference yeah. and its price difference could go from par to 50 the buck to zero. That scared, pushed off a lot of investors. Here, there was some uncertainty that everybody would start defaulting on their house, which could lead to Fannie and Freddie going out of business, but they're already in conservative ship. So that's the government's problem. Second is I think by, by accident or by purpose, Congress passed the CARES Act, which kept HPI where it is. So nobody's trying to refinance a mortgage that's 20 points underwater as they were in 2008. Right. So I think I think because the underlying assets are much better quality and people feel much more comfortable with them, then there's then there's much more interest. I mean, and the question I would ask Michael is, you know, we had a lot of liquidity issues with the REITs in March, too. That caused some shocks to the mortgage market, but not as much as 2008. No. There is a question by Nolan Bradshaw. Uh, Nolan, do you want to ask the question live? You could ask the question. You want me to ask or you want to ask yourself? You can ask, please. Thank you. So he's asking, uh, he said that the New York Times has an article that says that hedge funds and other Republican contributors got information that the coronavirus effect was going to be worse than what the Trump, the Trump White House officials were saying publicly. Uh, does that information change your understanding of the effects that you have seen in March? Um, I can start. Uh, so for clearing houses, um, I don't see that directly relate to the, the margin calls we see uh, from the CCPs. So yeah, so I would say that uh, does not change my understanding. Yeah. Does any other panelists want to add anything? No, I think, I think there's a lot of uncertainty about what it was going to happen. I'm sure some people were saying it was going to be better. Some people was going to say it's worse. It's not inside information as a, oh, I know this company is going to buy the other company. It's, I think this virus is going to be worse. So that's commodities market. You're allowed to trade on what you think the sun's going to, what you think sunshine's going to be, where they're growing cotton. It's something like that, at least in my opinion. Yeah, and I wasn't going to... Um you know, necessarily answer the question directly, but, you know, to go back to kind of the outstanding questions as to, um, you know, who was selling um, in March. And I think that's, it's, you know, still an open question. Um, as I said, you know, there was early work which suggested that this margin spiral was, you know, really an important factor, um, you know, driven by leveraged investors. And then, you know, more recently, um, the consensus or some work seems to have shifted uh, against the view that it was that it was hedge funds. Okay, perfect. So we are um, right on the hour. Uh, we we love to close here the formal part of the presentation. Uh, there will be an informal part uh, that will start right away. So please stay and uh, yeah, you can ask questions. You, we can have a more informal interaction with the panelists and also among ourselves. And just before I conclude, I would like to remind you that uh, there are upcoming deadlines for the SIAM FME conference. In fact, today is the deadline for the early career price admission. So please keep this in mind. And also keep in mind that uh, there are other deadlines regarding mini symposium submissions and the contributed talks. So start thinking about mini symposium that you want to organize and uh, submit a proposal that uh, we are looking forward to review. So thanks everybody and uh, please stay on for the informal part. We'll stop the recording now.